twisted family relations. He's saying, my son threatened to kill me. And questions about the victim himself. I'm going to take control of the situation. When a family's at war, all bets are off. This case is a made-for-TV movie. What the heck is going on? Plus, a mother's search for family history and the dark secret it unleashed. They are warning others about a Convicted felon. Convicted felon. A man from their past. And he gave me this just sort of evil smile. Now a part of their present. Everything that you knew to be true all of a sudden wasn't. Strange relations. And a bank teller forced to strap on a bomb to rob her own bank. <laughs> but is she the pawn or the queen? It was just like money everywhere. She's filling holes before we even find them. Secret intentions. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Sometimes people surprise us in the most troubling ways. A neighbor, co-worker, even a spouse harboring deep and disturbing secrets. Coming up, three stories of ordinary people plotting shocking deceptions. First, a mysterious shooting on the highway. It appeared to be a case of road rage. But as Gio Benitez first reported in 2014, peel back the layers and a tale of twisted family relationships emerges where everyone takes sides and someone decides to get even. Las Vegas, 4.30 a.m. on a brisk November morning. As the party on the strip winds down, Robert Bessie is putting pedal to the metal on Interstate 15, hurrying to his job as a heavy machine operator at a landfill out in the Mojave Desert. Suddenly, he's got company. I'm about midway into my commute. A vehicle comes onto the highway. They just kind of hang right there. As I turn my head, I hear a pop. The car speeds off as quickly as it appeared, and it takes Robert a few moments to realize what's happened. In the corner of my eye, I could see that my rear window was blown out. At that point, I feel some blood in the back of my neck. I can feel the spent ammunition, the bullet. So I call 911. What was it that you noticed right away about that car? The gold color of the fender. Robert is rushed to Las Vegas University Medical Center where doctors do, in fact, remove a single bullet from his neck. As you can see from this photo of his wounds, his odds of survival were longer than drawing an inside straight flush at Caesars. Because I was turned and it hit the skull, that's what stopped me from dying. Authorities are puzzled. It's a scary situation, but what So it's no surprise saying? local reporters paint Robert Bessie's shooting as a road rage story at first. Road rage, which authorities say could be the case here. But as detectives interview Robert in the hospital, he presents a far stranger explanation of how that bullet wound up in his neck. You have family drama combined with wild allegations. This case is a made-for-TV movie. 20 years ago, Robert Bessie married Amy Pearson, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed stunner. It was great. I love my wife. They treated me like a queen. They each have two children from previous relationships, then they have three more together. In this photo from a Disneyland vacation, they're your average happy family. Nothing in the world matters to me but my kids. Our email address was the Bessie Bunch, you know, after the Brady Bunch. There's seven kids and two parents, so nine of us. It was hectic. It was never boring. She may dye her hair these days, but Allie, who became Robert's adopted daughter, says that's because growing up, there was another side of life with her new dad. Robert enforced strict codes of dress and behavior. They wanted us to seem like the perfect family when behind closed doors, it was, it was hell. According to Amy's sisters, Mary Johnson and Donna Speakman, Robert even dressed his once glamorous wife. Amy wasn't allowed to wear certain clothes. It was loose and baggy, nothing to show for him. It came to a point to where Robert would lay her clothes out in the morning before he went to work. And that's when we started going, wait a minute, Amy, what's going on? And what would she say? She's like, I'm being obedient to my husband. The family says you were controlling. Were you? When I meant no, I meant no. When I meant yes, I meant yes. Is that controlling? I don't know. For years, Amy was okay with that arrangement. 
Being a wife is exactly what I was made to be. But the same could not be said for her firstborn son, Michael, who became Robert's adopted son. He was a disciplinarian. This was not his biological child. There were problems. As Michael grew up, he was so intimidated from Robert because he couldn't do anything right. As soon as mom's little soldier turns 19, Michael makes his escape, ditching the discipline of his desert home for the relative tranquility of the U.S. Army. Michael joining the Army was that to get away? He wanted to become a man, that was his words. After a tour of duty in South Korea, Michael returns, a different person. He was so changed. He stood tall. He would look you right in the eyes. So now, here we have Robert, the man of the house. Did they butt heads? Michael had grown a pair at this point. Two alpha dogs fighting. It just got worse and worse and worse. The animosity and the level of all of it. It all comes to a head in 2012. Six months before the shooting, Robert moves out and divorce proceedings begin. Good morning, we're here on Bessie versus Bessie. I did what was right and I got away. It's time to move on. But had everybody really moved on? No, not according to Robert. From his hospital bed, Robert tells police that adopted son Michael still harbors a burning rage. He's not just talking about typical problems in a family. He's saying, my son threatened to kill me. And so the authorities now have a real lead. But Michael insisted he'd spent the night before with his mom over at his Aunt Mary's house, everyone enjoying a big spaghetti dinner. And Amy tells police he was home with her the rest of the night. Did you stay there at your house? Yeah. Did Michael leave the house? No. And remember, Robert specifically recalled that the shot came from a gold SUV. Michael drove a pewter gray Bronco. The shooting remains a mystery until a tip breaks the case wide open. The suspect's vehicle was a gold-colored Gold-colored Chevy Tahoe or Suburban. Thanks to news coverage, a trucker reports seeing a gold SUV at this gas station the morning of the shooting, just a few miles from the interstate. If Robert hadn't said gold SUV, we don't have our key piece of evidence. Police head here and check the security cameras. In a word, bingo, and we're not talking scratch off. That's Michael there buying a monster energy drink and snacks at the counter with his uncle Rick, Amy's brother, and an ex-con fresh out of prison. And in that video, there was a little smile, wasn't there? Oh yeah, there was a smirk for sure. And that for you, was that chilling? Absolutely. After scooping up their munchies, the two get into the SUV and drive off in the direction of I-15, where Robert was about to be shot. Soon, police track down that SUV. It belongs to Uncle Rick's girlfriend. In short order, they slap the cuffs on gang that literally couldn't shoot straight. Police say they made an arrest in a shooting on I-15. Case closed, not by a long shot. Police are about to unearth more stunning revelations about the Bessie bunch. Robert Bessie was suggesting that Michael wants his mother to himself. And is the victim of the shooting guilty of something himself? Did you hit Amy? What the heck's going on? What is going on? When we return. Twenty-one-year-old Michael Bessie, another man identified as Richard Pearson, is arrested on attempted murder and battery charges. Even after Michael Bessie and his uncle Rick have been arrested in the attempted murder of Michael's adoptive father, Robert, investigators are just scratching the surface of this case. This case kind of got out of control quickly. That's because Robert has made a most disturbing allegation, telling police Michael has an unnatural relationship with his mother and describing a letter Michael had written to Amy with the phrase, I miss touching you. There is no question that Robert Bessie was suggesting that Amy was having an incestuous relationship with Michael. By making these allegations, he is suggesting a possible motive that Michael, his adopted son, wants him out of the picture so he can have his mother to himself. Robert kept insisting that Michael was getting too close to his wife. It's ludicrous. He was jealous. <laughs> he was Michael. jealous. Amy denies there was ever anything wrong about her relationship with her son. 
and she's making an alarming allegation of her own. She claims Robert wasn't just overbearing, he was physically abusive for years. It went on for a while, it went on for quite a while. So why did you stay with him? Where was I supposed to go? What, what was I supposed to do? She says she'd finally had enough when Robert gave her these bruises and a big blowout six months before the shooting. He went off and it was where I was on the floor with my hands and legs in the air telling him I just want to get up. I couldn't even breathe anymore. Amy's abuse allegations are backed up by Michael and by Amy's sister. So what does dear old dad say about all this? Did you hit Amy? I'm going to take control of the situation. I won't talk about anybody in my family, and that is me taking control right now. And that is my example of controlling. You won't say whether I did you hit anyone or not. We're not talking about that. Police are now exploring a new theory that Robert's estranged wife hated him enough to have plotted his murder with Michael and Uncle Rick. Were they just pawns in this game? And was Amy the queen? We suspected Amy was involved because she was the one that directly benefits from Robert's death. She's the mastermind. But prosecutors don't think Amy's motive was her safety. Robert had already moved out of the house and was keeping his distance. No, they say, it's something much simpler, something folks in Vegas would understand, a jackpot. She was the beneficiary of his life insurance policy. And that life insurance policy was worth $250,000. But Amy told police just what she told us. Sitting here today, you can say you had absolutely nothing to do with that shooting. Positively. Absolutely. Nothing. Her alibi? The same as Michael's. She says she was at that spaghetti dinner at her sister's house the night before, then went home and was asleep in bed when the crime occurred. A month after Michael's arrest, Amy is still in the family home with her kids, being a mom. That's when a bombshell explodes in the district attorney's office. We had a jailhouse informant send a letter actually to Sam's desk. Michael has been spilling his guts to a snitch, saying mommy had murder on her mind. As I read the letter, there were a number of details that he provided. Among those details, that Amy had been plotting Robert's murder for months. Robert and Amy had the big blowout that um, spawned the whole divorce proceedings. I think that's when she started to plot his death. And the letter also blows up Amy's alibi and puts her near the scene of the crime. Michael has told the snitch Amy didn't stay home in bed. In fact, she drove to a diner just down the highway from the shooting, picked up Michael and helped him get away. The noose is tightening. At that point, did you think you would be arrested? No, I didn't have any idea about any of it. That is beyond me. That is evil. The prosecutors aren't buying it. They charge Amy with seven different felony counts and get ready to take her to trial. Amy Bessie is charged with plotting to kill her husband in a drive-by shooting with her brother and her son carrying out the crime. As the trial begins, the prosecutors come out swinging. Hell hath no fury as a woman scorned. And that fury is the rage that she felt against her husband, Robert Bessie. They tell the jury that they now have evidence Amy had hatched schemes to off her husband, not once, not twice, but she tried at least three times. What follows is a parade of would-be and wannabe assassins. Enter Courtney Smith, Michael's ex-girlfriend. She testified that Amy spoke about that insurance policy incessantly. She said that it was for $250,000 and that she had made the comment that he was worth more dead than alive. And Smith says she was in on one of the first unsuccessful murder plots, a failed attempt to poison Robert on Father's Day. Death would be delivered in a can of Red Bull laced with arsenic. Who delivered that Red Bull to Robert? I did. Who actually handed it to you to deliver to Robert? Amy. The defense draws out that Courtney has an axe to grind with Amy. And then you have a conversation with police, during which you describe uh, Amy as a bitch. She can be. Up next, Vincent Sweeber, Michael's biological father, 
Prosecutors say Amy tried to recruit him as a hitman too. There come a point in time where she asked you to make him disappear. Yeah. Okay. What did you take that to mean? Dead. The third time was the charm. Prosecutors say Amy decided to keep things in the family, turning to her baby brother, ex-con Rick Pearson, recruiting him and her own son, Michael, to do her dirty work. Everything leads back to Amy Bessie. Did you ever tell Rick or Michael or both, did you ever tell them, I wish she was dead? No. Not in those words. I did make the comment in front of everybody in my family that I wish the son of a bitch was dead. So in front of your family, you told them, I wish he was dead. Yeah, as a blanket statement, not somebody do this for me, somebody do this for me, like it was portrayed at trial. That quote is one of those things that you wish you could take back. But there's no going back now. Prosecutors are finally ready to lay out their chronology of the crime. It is the night before the shooting. Amy and Michael are at that spaghetti dinner at Aunt Mary's. At 10.44 p.m., Prosecutors say a telltale text is sent from Uncle Rick to Amy. Rick was communicating with Amy and saying, well, just everybody there, I love it when a plan comes together. 1.47 a.m., the plan is afoot. Prosecutors say the three conspirators go silent on their cell phones. 3.28 a.m., Michael and Uncle Rick pick up that energy drink and get spotted by the gas station security cameras near the scene of the crime. She said if her tweaker brother hadn't stopped to get an energy drink, they would have never gotten caught. 4.35 a.m., the plan is executed on that lonely stretch of Interstate 15. Who do you think pulled the trigger? It's impossible to say. And at 5.07, yet another boneheaded mistake. Uncle Rick calls Amy, pinging a tower nearby the crime scene. There's no question this was amateur hour. Staring at a maximum prison sentence of 91 years, Amy rolls the dice, testifies on her own behalf. I said that I wanted him dead. That's different from what you're saying. But now she flip-flops. No, she didn't just go home from that spaghetti dinner and go to bed like she told the cops. On the stand, she says she did drive to that diner to pick up her son, Michael, but it was totally innocent. I went and picked him up. I never saw the vehicle. That's what my brother said. They had a flat, take Michael home. I said, okay. I sat and had a cup of coffee okay. and took my son home. Amy continues to proclaim her innocence through a two-week trial. Did you participate in any way in the attempt on Robert Bessie's life? No, I did not. But the Vegas jury doesn't go for it returning a verdict in time to make it home for dinner. Guilty of conspiracy to commit murder. Uh, Ms. Bessie, I've given a uh, great thought to this. The judge sentences Amy to 14 to 44 years. Michael and Rick plead guilty. They declined our requests for interviews. As for the matriarch of the Bessie Bunch, well, she's okay with how things turned out. She says these concrete walls and barbed wire fences are actually an upgrade from her old, ball and chain. I might be in jail, but for the last 20 years, I've been in prison. So for me to, to have the freedom of my own will, instead of a will being imposed on me on a daily basis, there is a freedom in that. Amy Bessie will be eligible for parole in 2019. As of 2015, she's appealing her conviction. Michael Bessie was sentenced to 10 to 26 years for his part in the murder plot. Rick Pearson was sentenced to 12 to 30 years. And Michael's ex-girlfriend, Courtney Smith, who testified that she delivered that arsenic-laced Red Bull to Robert, later pled guilty to accessory to commit a felony and was sentenced to three years probation. As for Robert Bessie, he says life is great, that he and his three kids are moving on. Up next, a convicted felon with a disturbing past. Tom kidnapped this young woman. We were so scared we would walk on the other side of the road. And a legacy that could haunt for years to come. This wasn't a mistake. This was done intentionally. When we come back. Sometimes deception can take years to unravel. 
For the woman you're about to meet, a simple act would uncover a shocking secret more than two decades in the past. And as Cecilia Vega first reported in 2014, it would shake the very notion of what defines her family. It started off as a hobby, researching family history. So it gets addictive. Yep, and um, boy, did I get bit by the bug. But what Pam Branham uncovered would reveal an unthinkable secret about her 21-year-old daughter. It involves a fertility clinic and a monster unleashed from the grave. Stunning story, bizarre story. They are warning others about a Convicted man. felon. Convicted felon. It shakes your world, absolutely. Because everything that you knew to be true all of a sudden wasn't. You know, you're like pinching yourself going, this is like the worst dream I've ever had. I'm going to wake up and it didn't happen. It happened. It happened. It happened in Salt Lake City. Newlyweds John and Pam Branham are trying to start a family with no success. So as a last resort, they go to a fertility clinic here on the campus of the University of Utah. A friendly lab technician shows them a photo collage above his desk of babies conceived by artificial insemination. You know, I just looked at those pictures and I thought, this is going to be it. Maybe this is going to happen for us. But something about the lab tech doesn't sit right with John. I remember handing him the sperm specimen, and he gave me this just sort of evil smile. It just made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I thought, whoa. <laughs> John's reaction is soon forgotten, though, with the arrival nine months later of a beautiful baby girl, Annie. Couldn't have been happier. Not a creature was stirring. Flash through the years. First step. Look at her go. And the memories. She's musically inclined, and we always kind of wonder where that came from. Annie grows into a beautiful, bright young woman, a college whiz kid who studies astrophysics and surprises her parents with her gift for math. I barely made it through Calculus 1. Well, in Annie's second year of college, she was doing Calculus 3, making A's, and I'm thinking, there's a recessive gene at work there, right? <laughs> With her nest now empty, Pam picks up a hobby and gets hooked on researching the family tree. She'd be up to two or three o'clock in the morning uh, doing this. These days, anyone can stick a swab inside their cheek, go online, and for a few bucks, discover relatives and health histories they never knew they had. Pam Branham swabbed the whole family. I thought it was really interesting how it tells you about your health, it tells you where you come from. As expected, when the results come back, you can see how it's totally lit up. Pam finds that Annie shares 50% of her mom's DNA. But what about her dad? And it said that they shared zero DNA. I was in a panic. You know, I was in a complete panic. Annie walked through the door, didn't say a word, gave me a big hug, started sobbing. I think it took a very long time for it to sink in. What was it that, that sunk in? Trying to comprehend what it meant that um, he wasn't my biological father, and then who is? The Branhams say they couldn't get answers from the university. It would take a DNA detective to get to the bottom of it. They wanted to know what her biological heritage was on her paternal side. Finding biological fathers is a specialty of C.C. Moore, a genetic genealogist in Southern California. Desperate for answers, Pam sends her an email. This is right up my alley. She tells Pam to send Annie's DNA to multiple online databases. And in this type of work, we always say if we can find a second cousin or a predicted second cousin, we're pretty much in business. We can usually solve the case. Moore's hunch pays off, and the plot thickens with a single match between Annie's DNA and this toad stranger in Minnesota, Arla Evans. What this retired school secretary knows will blow open the whole story. She asked me if I had a relative that might have donated sperm, and I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. And I said, well, can you tell me where he, he lives? And I said, well, he lived in Salt Lake City a lot, and I know he used to work for a fertility clinic there. And I thought, okay, that's it, that's it. That relative was Carla's cousin, Tom Lippert. Pam and Carla exchange photos, and suddenly, pieces of the puzzle start falling into place. When I first saw Annie's graduation picture, it looks almost identical to Tom's graduation picture. When I saw that photo, I just knew that Tom was the, the father. She also recalls some things that might explain Annie's interest in music and her college ambitions. 
Well, Tom was very talented. He was very uh, intelligent. He went to Notre Dame Law School. He was also musical. And I looked at those pictures and I recognized him. You recognized him? He was the man at the clinic. I could picture all those baby pictures behind him, the ones that he was so proud of. Well, he made a big deal out of the fact that these were all the families that I've helped conceive. This is so creepy. Picturing him sitting next to that wall is chilling. And I just thought to myself, this wasn't a mistake. This was done intentionally. But the street dead ends in a cemetery. Tom Lip died in 1999. Case closed. Until, that is, Carla Evans drops a bombshell. And said, Pam, there's something I need to tell you, and I want to be totally upfront with you about who my cousin was and what he did. Tom kidnapped this young woman. That's right. Tom Lippert was a convict, a kidnapper who gained national attention in 1975, sentenced to six years in prison for abducting a young woman. The details would unhinge everyone. He held her for three weeks, sometimes in a metal studded box. For me, that was as devastating almost as finding out. After getting out of prison, Lippert married a nurse, Jean, and settled in this quiet Salt Lake neighborhood. He terrorized the neighborhood kids. We were so scared we would walk on the other side of the road. Tessa Murdoch says Lippert threw rocks, broke windows, and even made the local news. Did you throw these rocks last night? Absolutely not. I never knew why he hated kids so much. Ironic because hating kids didn't stop him from conceiving them, allegedly swapping his sperm for that of patients while working as a lab tech in the fertility clinic at the University of Utah. At the time, the clinic did not do criminal background checks on prospective employees. We are deeply sorry for any anxiety this has caused to our patients. The university admitted that many lab records were destroyed. They can only guess how many sperm samples were handled or mishandled by Tom Lippert. DNA detective C.C. Moore created a blog that's already gotten responses from at least five more possible Lippert offspring, who'd be Annie's half-siblings. You think there are other families out there right now who were duped just like you? I know it. I know without a doubt. I'm starting to hear from them. I wouldn't wish this on any other family. Still, the Branhams know their turmoil is far outweighed by the one beautiful blessing that came out of it, their daughter, Annie. What have you learned about yourself, about your family? That we're just the same. My dad is my dad, regardless of whether or not he's biologically related to me. He's the one who raised me. Annie Branham later graduated with honors in astrophysics and plans to apply to medical school. The fertility clinic the Branhams used closed in 1998. The University of Utah Medical Group reported that while several other families have come forward for testing, as of 2015, none have been matched to Tom Lippert. They continue to offer free DNA testing to concerned patients. None of the families who contacted C.C. Moore have been matched to Lippert either. However, as of 2015, the Branhams say they did discover one person who matched Annie's DNA. When we come back, a bank teller turned into a walking time bomb. I have something strapped to me. But the real bombshell is the story behind it. You think you've seen it all, and then you find out that you haven't. When we come back. A brazen robbery caught on tape. A panicked employee, bombs strapped to her body, forced to steal from her own bank. But as Jay Shadler first reported in 2014, that's just the beginning of this explosive story. The sun's coming up over East Los Angeles, and a bank heist is going down. Breaking news out of East Los Angeles, kidnapping and robbery at a Bank of America. A longtime bank employee has been kidnapped, strapped with a bomb, and forced into robbing her own bank. I don't know why. I have something strapped to me. And you hurry. I'm so scared. We're coming, honey. We're going to blow out. Alerted, the L.A. bomb squad rolls out of its headquarters and heads to the bank on South Atlantic Boulevard. This would be the highest uh, 
threat level. Bomb squad veterans Joseph Acevedo and Rob Harris. There's helicopters, there's police cars, you know, yeah. people were pushed way back. The hunt is on for two bank robbers who strapped local up. reporter Rob Hayes is covering the heist for KABC. We're shooting from far, we had the chopper up, and uh, we're just kind of waiting for this thing to play out. We have an innocent victim that's lives in danger. Our number one priority is to get to that person. The victim is Aurora Barrera, an assistant manager for the bank and an LA native. At 8.20, with the bank still closed, surveillance cameras inside and out show Barrera carefully following the kidnapper's instructions, enlisting the help of the only other employee in the bank as she empties the vault and tosses two bags with a half million dollars out the side door. At the very moment Aurora is dropping the bags out this bank door, a getaway car is pulling up on this side street. The robbers have timed this perfectly. We know that because one of the robbers spoke exclusively with 2020. It was like one of those moments where you, you have no control over your body, you're just in shock. It was just like money everywhere. Brian Perez has been recruited into this heist by his friend Richard Menchaca, who drove the first getaway car. Perez says the money is now transferred to his car to keep police off their trail. The handoff takes place at this car wash right around the corner from the bank. So he opened my door and he pretty much threw all the money in the back of the car. You're sitting in a car wash, looking in the back seat. With over a half a million dollars. dollars. Yeah. And he closes it up? Yeah. And then what? He tells me to go, he slapped the car like, get out of here. Back at the bank, the bomb squad begins the delicate but dangerous work of removing the bomb from Aurora Barrera's body. She was sitting in a chair at the desk, just saying, please, 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 I don't want to die, I don't want to die. We saw a black cylinder object below her rib cage, yeah. and then we could see a cable. And some electrical tape, that is how it was connected to her body. After calming Barrera, the device is gently removed from her. That's her finally walking free from the bomb and the bank. Now the device is isolated and destroyed with the help of the squad's robot. I went back down with the bomb suit and I got down and pulled all the pieces apart and saw that there was uh, no high explosives, there was no circuitry, it was not a bomb. Detective Harris signals code four, meaning all is safe. The device is a fake, but an effective one. The robbers have made away with over $500,000 without ever having stepped into the bank. Where did the money go? It's a great question. This is a special agent. FBI Special Agent Nicole Black and Huntington Park Detective Joe Settles are the first to interview Aurora after the heist. She was emotional during the interview. She would go into trying to describe the events, how scared she was at the time. I took a shower and... Slowly, the single 32-year-old woman recounts her early morning abduction. She got up in the morning, got ready for work. She went out to her garage as normal, and once she opened the garage, she was accosted by two black males. They told me that they've been following me, that they knew where I worked, and that I better do everything that they tell me to do. I held at gunpoint and forced to tape a some sort of device on her stomach. I told to strap it to myself. He gave me the tape. And then you put it around my waist and have some wires. Mm -hmm. I just saw wires and I'm scared. They gave me a backpack and they told me to stuff it with the money and to throw it through the side door. But if I didn't do what they told me to do, that I was going to get hurt really bad. As night falls, the search for Barrera's kidnappers and bank robbers goes on. Authorities are following leads, attempting to track down those two suspects who apparently knew they were African American or black. Um, all I could see was part of this right here um, and the way they taught, they spoke. But Barrera's memory is vague, and police begin privately questioning whether she was the pawn in this high stakes game or perhaps the queen. Stay with us because this bank heist is about to turn into a Bonnie and Clyde whodunit.
When we first met assistant bank manager Aurora Barrera. With two men inside my garage and they pointed me with a gun and they strapped me. She had a bomb strapped to her. That's her walking through the bank with the device under her shirt. Two mysterious robbers had kidnapped her and had forced her into looting more than a half million bucks from her own bank. Forced to open the vault, throwing bags of cash out the back door. In addition to swarming media coverage, local detectives, prosecutors, and now the FBI are all involved in this bizarre case. Bank robbery, bomb, kidnapping. You got a trifecta there. But you can bet the story's just starting when the cops begin pressing Barrera. Looking for answers, they find only questions and doubts. I want you to make sure that you're thinking of all your senses. Red flag number one, Barrera's demeanor on bank surveillance. At times, she buttons her jacket or kind of tries to potentially hold the device up as if it may be falling off. A reasonable person that would think they had a device strapped on them that was going to blow up. You'd think she'd be on eggshells the entire time. Right, and she wasn't. Red flag number two. Barrera's long on dramatics, short on details. What did you hear? What did you see? What did you smell? Um, she couldn't answer those questions for critical points in the timeline. It was like pulling teeth. But one of the things that we noticed right away was that she had a tough time calling the device a bomb. She was very reluctant to say anything more than that thing. The other guy gave me the whole thing. He's the one that had that thing. He was holding the thing. And the bomb, as we know, turned out to be a hoax, leading to red flag number three. Okay, so you're kind of holding it yeah. in place with your right arm, and then just putting some scraps of tape there. Barrera says the electrical tape used to attach the device was torn with her own hands. The tape stretches uh, when you try to tear it. Um, usually you need scissors to cut that sort of tape, which would create clean edges, and that seems to be the case in these photographs. And it would be very difficult to hold a device, yeah. hold a shirt up, tear or cut tape while being held at gunpoint. And finally, red flag number four. Maybe we stuffed the bag mostly with singles. Instead of filling the bags with singles, as she claims, Barrera went straight for her bank's big bills. So what you can see is that uh, Aurora, in loading up the money, took only the large bills and left behind the ones. If it was your bank and you, you were trying to protect it, you'd think you'd start with the ones and leave the hundreds behind. But all of these red flags are just circumstantial evidence. The license plate of the getaway car is not. Watch, right after Barrera drops the money out of the bank's back door, her co-worker rushes to look out a side window, glimpsing the license plate and giving investigators a solid break in the case. The car is linked to Barrera's boyfriend, Ray Vega, an ex-Marine and a firearms instructor. Vega is cocksure of himself and a tad too angry when the cops call him in for questioning. So I'm pretty pissed off. You could have called me, man. I got hooked in front of a bunch of people, people that respect me and that I respected. That's really jacked up. He was very uh, agitated. He was angry at the fact that he was uh, being investigated for being part of the robbery. I may be a man or a dirtbag, but I'm not a bank robber. Try telling that to your accomplice, Brian Perez, who spoke to us in an exclusive interview. How would you describe Vega? An intimidating uh, guy. Um, Vega just came off as like a James Bond kind of wannabe. You look into his eyes and you kind of realize that he might not be totally sane. Perez, who will later become one of the chief witnesses against both Vega and Barrera, laid out the whole heist to us while driving through the key East LA locations. Basic plan was he had a girlfriend that worked inside, was going to be a bomb on her chest. She was going to throw money outside of a door. Someone was supposed to pick it up and drive off of it. What did you think? Crazy. In my mind, I was like, well, this guy's nuts. And yet, you agreed to it. I mean, yeah, I did agree to it. He threatened me. He could put a bomb in, in my car, my parents' car. Fearing Vega, Perez continues with the plan. That's him rendezvousing with Vega in a parking lot near the bank. Later, Perez transfers the loot to this suitcase and heads to a Ramada Inn seven miles away from where the heist went down. Here, Perez, Vega, and the driver of the first getaway car, Richard Menchaca, were to begin splitting the spoils. Vega shows up, he enters through the door right there. Uh, first thing he looks, he doesn't even look at us, he looks at the money on the table. 
Um, he just says, I can't believe it. You know, we got away with it. Is that what he says? Yeah. And, uh, Is that what he says? They all might have gone scot-free if not for Ray Vega's king-size ego. Even in front of the cops, humility is not one of his strong suits. In fact, he's so confident in himself that he, he's basically begging you to go look for information on him. Yeah, he's filling holes before we even find them for us. Like this. If you guys can pull up my phone, you guys can see the history. Then you guys can see where it pinged off the cell phone towers where the hell I was. They did, and he wasn't. His phone was using cell towers 20 miles away when he was supposed to have spent all night at this day's inn. I do think he believed that he could convince us that his story was true, enough so that we wouldn't look into it further. At trial, Brian Perez's testimony against his former accomplices proved crucial. He was sentenced to five years probation, but Vega got 14 years, Barrera nine. So was Barrera the mastermind of this heist or just one of the players? She walked into the bank uh, armed with a hoax explosive. I, I would always think that Aurora planned everything inside the bank because she knew the bank. She knew how to uh, get into the vault. And the money made it out the side door of the bank, which was the ultimate goal. So to that extent, Aurora pulled it off. She did. In the end, while the criminals were caught, where's the money? If anyone has the answer to that, they can feel free to give our office a call. As for the bomb squad guys who were willing to risk their lives to save Aurora Barrera, I couldn't help asking. When you learned ultimately that she was part of the hoax, what went through your head? It was one of those moments where you, you think you've seen it all, and then you find out that you haven't, you know? <laughs> As of 2015, both Aurora Barrera and Ray Vega are appealing their convictions. All the defendants were ordered to repay the money they stole from the bank. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.